Uh, yesterday it wasn't a big problem. Today, how big a problem is it? Well, look, we've been working closely with the food industry, uh, both the manufacturers and the retailers over the last week or so, monitoring the situation closely, uh, looking at um, indices such as late deliveries to individual stores and uh, absence levels. And um, the industry had some concerns at the end of last week, but we've been keeping it under close review. What's clear is that early this week, uh, those absence levels got to about 15, in some cases 20%. And that's why we decided to act swiftly to make sure that the food supply chain can continue to function normally. OK. Um, one of your colleagues, Tobias Elwood, has intimated that we might have to call on the military. Uh, others have said it's not the case. What do you understand to be the reality, Mr Eustace? Um, it's not the case. Uh, we've we've taken the, the right steps now, obviously, to ensure that uh, the food supply chain uh, works. We've acted quickly to, to do that when we saw absence levels starting to continue to rise this week. Um, and we don't have a, a need for that at the moment. But look, there's always um, a, um, a military contingency force that's on standby at all times, because if we have a flood event or another um, emergency of some sort, you always have to be able to call on them. So they are always there on on standby should they be needed, but they're not needed at the moment. I see, see, the thing is, when the minister was sitting there yesterday, he was giving me the impression that I was overreacting by saying that there was a problem. Well, I, I think he was right in the sense that um, uh, there wasn't a problem in that we had um, some stress starting to come on the system, uh, but we were working closely with industry and it was really during the course of yesterday, uh, having had further discussions with them, seeing that absence rates uh, had increased to a level uh, that was starting to concern us and that it was likely now to continue to increase a bit further. It was um, that that decided, uh, uh, decided the situation and we acted swiftly. You know, we're never going to take risks with our food supply uh, and that's why we've acted in the way we have. How many people are going to be exempt from uh, having to isolate if they're picked? Well, uh, under the scheme that we've put forward now for the food sector, we've identified close to 500 key sites. That uh, includes around 170 supermarket depots uh, and then another couple of hundred key manufacturers like our bread manufacturers, dairy companies and so on. Uh, and uh, all of the people working in those key strategic sites, uh, distribution depots uh, and those manufacturing facilities will be able to use this scheme. And it's probably well over 10,000 people. Um, I've been through the 16 sectors that have been uh, featured here. How is it determined that they would be uh, uh, allowed this uh, extra leeway? Good morning, Secretary of State. Good morning. Well, look, there's, there's two uh, separate things that we've, we've done. The first is a, a much bigger intervention on the food supply chain. So we've identified already close to 500 sites, including around 170 supermarket depots and then uh, several hundred of the um, largest, most strategically important manufacturers. And um, we're starting from today in, in the first 15 of those depots and we'll be rolling out quickly that where they have staff who are pinged and are asked to uh, isolate, they can continue to come into work do a daily test at work and provided that test stays negative they can keep working so that's the most significant uh, thing which is going to affect well over 10,000 uh, people uh, playing crucial roles in the food supply chain uh, and that applies to them whatever their job might be whether they're a forklift driver or picking up goods um, that that will apply to them the, the separate thing is a, it's a narrower one for some of the smaller sectors key roles for instance technical jobs in things like nuclear power stations or in the water industry uh, or in the rail network network, key people that are essential to keep those uh, services um, running. There's going to be a narrow exemption for particular jobs um, and um, those businesses will be able to contact the department concerned and say they've got a list of people that they need to have back and we can authorise it. Have the, uh, the exemptions that your government has given to certain critical workers, has that been enough to stem the problems in this industry? I think it's the right thing to do for now. What we've done is identify uh, 500 of the key strategically important sites in the food industry. That's roughly 170 uh, supermarket depots and then several hundred of the largest food manufacturers. Uh, and we think that that's going to uh, really help to get um, absence levels down in that sector so that we can get food to those individual stores. Um, now, the thing is, that these the, we know that supply chains are just that. We've spoken to experts in this field, chains. And if you get one bit of the chain that, that uh, is, is uh, not affected uh, by these exemptions, then, of course, you're still going to have the problems. But there's also an issue in terms of even those who are exempted. Um, it's, a, it's a very few number, just like 10,000 critical workers in supply chains and others. And, uh, and yet they, they don't have an automatic exemption, do they? Their, their company boss has to write to your department and say, would it be 
OK if, you know, if Jim Smith could have a, an exemption, please. This is the job he does and we think he's very important. And then a bureaucrat who's presumably not self-isolating at that moment has to write back and give a letter saying, yes, this person could be exempt. Um, with all due respect to governments, I'm not entirely sure this is going to be a very quick process. People will probably be out of self-isolation before they get their letter back, won't they? Well, look, there's, there's a separate thing that's being done for other sectors like the nuclear power industry and the rail industry for where for critical roles, individuals, uh, they can get an exemption. That's going to be a very limited value in the food industry. I, I recognise that. What we've done on the food supply chain is very different. We've already identified those 500 key sites. They won't have to write to us to say uh, these are the names, these are the individuals, um, anybody working at those sites will be able to turn up and have a test and continue to work. OK, just coming back finally on this aspect, these uh, the sectors that are on the so-called let-off list, uh, a lot to do with food. Why nothing to do with faith? Why not clergymen, clergywomen, rabbis? Why don't you care about them? Well, look, I care about everybody and we want everybody to be able to get back to life as normal and um, everybody's going to be able to uh, adopt an approach like this from the middle of August. But the reason we've had very narrow exemptions in food, it's for the obvious reason that we will never, ever take risks with the food supply chain. So we've right. acted swiftly uh, and across the board there. Uh, and then on these other sectors, uh, we're, we're focusing on just no, those I, few I, key I, I, jobs. I get that. But for, for many people, particularly at trying times such as these, Secretary of State, their faith is very important. Why aren't vicars and rabbis and imams, why aren't they on the list? Well, look, faith is important, and obviously well, even not, during the... Not to your government, it's not, is it? Because well, it's not on the 16 um, sectors, Secretary of State. And if it was important, it, it would be one of the 16 sectors. And people haven't been able to go to church, churches are still locked up, people can't sing in church. Your government does not respect faith, does it, Mr Eustace? Well, I, I don't accept that. We, we, well, we, why we, can't of course why aren't we, on the list then, and rabbis? Well, well, they're not on the list as as, uh, as key workers. Because well, I would say they're pretty they key, to... wouldn't you? Do you think a vicar's well, a key worker, Mr Eustace? Um, I, I don't think um, no, no, they're in the same... No, no, it's a simple yes or no. Is an imam a key worker? Is a rabbi a key worker, Mr Eustace? Um, they're not a key worker no, in the not. sense that they no, not in the sense that someone working in the food industry getting food on people's plates is. And, and I think what you have to understand is we're talking here about a, a few weeks that we want everybody to be back uh, to normal. Everybody's in roles that ha are important uh, and, and uh, everybody's uh, role is valued. But for this purposes, we've had to focus on those uh, crucial key workers in those key sectors to make sure the just, food supply. Just lastly continues. on this point, Mr. Eustace, a vicar. A priest, a rabbi, who visits a mourning family, a family in grief. To me, that's a key worker, but not to you. Well, look, during the pandemic, obviously, they've continued to do all of that work um, over the phone, calling people and doing, um, uh, you know, uh, online um, um, uh, you know, services for their congregation. It's been difficult for everyone. Uh, but look, this is a narrow exemption that we've got for key sectors like the food industry, which is obviously a, a different sort of level. A lot of red tape still, though, isn't there? I mean, people have to apply to be exempt, don't they? It's not as straightforward as just saying, OK, you can come in if you've been pinged. Well, there's two separate uh, schemes. So um, we have one of for the food Of course uh, we, uh, and, 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 and these things can seem complicated. So for sectors like um, the nuclear power industry, the rail network, uh, the, the water industry, where you have um, a small number of um, highly skilled professionals that you need to ensure can uh, come to work, uh, we're, we're having a, a, an exemption for them as well, where they, um, and it, but it's quite a narrow exemption. Uh, for the food sector, it's very different. Uh, this is is a uh, you know quite a quite a big exemption. So they don't need to apply. Uh, they don't need to apply, but we are working with all of those um, uh, food companies. We've identified the 500 sites. They the, the sites will be designated, and then they'll be able to operate this at a site level. Yeah, you see, the thing is, the hospitality sector is not included. Is it? it's been one of the hardest hits throughout the pandemic. Could they potentially, going forward, be added to the list? Well, look, obviously, um, for everyone uh, in the middle of August, we intend to move to a, a different system. Yeah, where, but for now? Uh, for now, um, I think not, no. So we are obviously keeping everything under review. The reason we've made a special uh, exception uh, for food is for very obvious reasons. Uh, we need to make sure that we maintain our food supply. We will never take risks with our food supply. Uh, when it comes to other sectors, yes, of course, the fact that they are also carrying high absence levels is causing some stress for them a and it's making it um, uh, more difficult.
difficult. But you also have to bear in mind why we're doing this. And we are trying to still just dampen uh, the, the pace and the velocity at which uh, this infection is spreading because we have to keep a, a very close eye on those hospitalizations. We know that if people are double jabbed, uh, then between 92 and 96 percent uh, reduction in hospitalizations is what we can expect. Uh, but there will still be some hospitalizations and sadly still uh, some deaths. And we just need to make sure uh, that we don't have this uh, growing too quickly. And that's the aim of this. So it could get worse before it gets better is what you're saying? Uh, absolutely. Okay, uh, so it is, is likely to because hospitalizations uh, do follow the, um, uh, you know, the, yeah, the infection course. rate by two to three weeks. Okay. That's why we're, we're doing this. I know it's frustrating for everybody, but we do want to try to just um, dampen the curve of this infection until it, uh, until it turns and things start to okay. uh, go in the other direction. And then, of course, we can move to a different system for everyone. OK, um, given that it could get worse before it gets better, is the military on standby? Um, we don't have any um, need or plans at the moment to use the military, but of course they're always uh, on standby. Uh, we always have uh, that option to um, call on the, uh, the, the contingency that the, the MOD always have in place for situations, but we don't need that at the moment. Well, given things change so quickly, I mean, as I said, the minister sitting there yesterday, a very different story to what we're getting from you today. It would be foolish, foolhardy not to have them on standby, wouldn't it? They're always on standby. We have a, a standing uh, part of the uh, the army that is always there should it need to be called on. Uh, we never know, for instance, when we're going to have a, a major flood incident that might affect us. And in those uh, situations, we, we regularly have troops that are on standby that can be uh, called on at the drop of a hat. That's a, a standard procedure in government. The Adam Smith Institute is suggesting that the figure of people who've been pinged could rise to more than two million next week, noting that the 16 sectors that you and your colleagues have freed up, why can't that be the case for everyone? If you have had your two jabs, if you'll have a daily test, why can't everyone go back to work? Well, that will be the case, obviously, from uh, the middle of August. Still uh, some way now, off, respectfully, there... Secretary of State. It, well, it's a, it's a few weeks off. Um, you know, for now, we want people to try to bide with us on this. Very difficult. I know it's very frustrating, but we know that if... Um, People have had close proximity to someone who's infected. They're five times more likely to get infected themselves. And we know that if people uh, do isolate when asked, it does dampen the spread of the virus. And what we're really just trying to achieve here over these next uh, few weeks is to dampen the spread of the virus, hopefully get it tipping back down the other way so that we'll know exactly where the peak in hospitalizations is. And the, if, we ha if it accelerates too quickly, uh, the concern we've got is that that peak in hospitalizations uh, might be too high. That's what we are mindful of. That's what we're cautious uh, about. But of course, you know, we keep everything under review. So we've acted swiftly yesterday to ensure uh, that we can um, make sure that those key bits of the food supply chain can operate. We'll keep everything under review in the next few weeks. OK, um, do you agree with Jeremy Hunt, the former health secretary, who said that uh, with this pandemic and, and not moving this the August 16th date forward, that actually the government is risking losing social consent? Well, look, it's definitely very frustrating for, uh, for everybody uh, to be uh, pinged and asked to isolate. We absolutely understand that. It's just for a few weeks more. We're just asking for people to, to bide with us, uh, help us make sure that we can uh, spread that peak, reduce that peak, because we do know that there will be a peak in hospitalizations that will follow some two to three weeks later. That's the bit that we're concerned about. That's what we're mindful of. That's why we want to try and spread that curve. I think a lot of the, the business and industry leaders who've written to the Prime Minister today saying they want that date brought forward, representing hospitality, retail, transport and many other food supply industries, uh, their, their point is, well, actually, there isn't any extra risk of spreading COVID or hospitalizations or deaths from perfectly healthy people proving they're perfectly healthy with a negative COVID test or more than one and going back to work. And you say it's just a few more weeks, but it's been just a few more weeks for many of these uh, uh, these private sector businesses and, and public sector for, for, for 16 months now. They're struggling. They're, they're, on their, they're on their knees and they need to get their staff into work so they can actually uh, run their businesses. It, a few more weeks to government civil servants and politicians like you on a full payroll is fine. It's much harder for people in the private sector. Well, look, it's because we recognise the impact that this has had on businesses that we have gone to that final stage of, of exiting lockdown. And we know that the, you know, the, uh, the people being pinged by the app and asked to isolate, you know, is causing uh, some pressures, obviously, and staff absences in many areas are running at about 15 percent at the moment. We do understand that, uh, but we're not doing it for nothing. We are doing it to try to uh, take the peak off this uh, current wave okay. as we exit uh, all the restrictions okay. and look, we are one of the few countries in the world that have 
taken this step, having uh, got ahead and vaccinated very early to actually now uh, move to exit um, uh, all restrictions. Okay. And the 16th of August um, was the date when people who were double jabbed don't have to self-isolate if they've been pinged. Uh, the previous health secretary, uh, Jeremy Hunt, of course, would be prime minister, uh, is saying that that should be brought forward. <sighs> Well, look, I know um, people are saying these things. We, I'd understand the case, and obviously we've adopted a, a different uh, approach already in the context of the food sector, which we've announced, and we've done that expeditiously, quickly, because it's needed to be done uh, in that way. We're keeping everything, obviously, under review uh, all of the time, but the reason uh, we're maintaining uh, the current uh, system of uh, test and track and isolate is that we know that if someone's been in contact uh, with somebody who's uh, tested positive, who's infectious, uh, they are... Uh, five times more likely to uh, pick up the virus themselves. Uh, that then uh, contributes significantly to the spread of the virus. So we're doing this to try to dampen the spread so that we can keep that uh, peak in hospitalizations at the lowest possible level. So it could come forward? Um, well, at the moment, it's not coming forward. Um, so we are... We, could it be got, extended further? Uh, well, we, look, we've got a clear plan, and until we are... Because you work on data, not dates, don't you? Uh, we, we do work on data, not dates, and um, the key test for us is really uh, the point at which um, things start to turn and we, we are confident that we are past the peak in infections. And then we can anticipate the peak in hospitalizations to come no, I some weeks after that. I understand, but you know, you've been a hostage to fortune when it's come to dates previously and you've had to move them uh, here and there. Is, is it a, a fool's errand to set dates? Well, I think people uh, want to have a clear idea of where they stand. And the reason we have set that date, and of course, it, you know, it could always, things can always change in either direction, but uh, the reason we set these dates is to give people uh, some kind of indication about what they can expect. And that's why the Prime Minister set out his uh, route map to get out of the lockdown. Uh, he was clear that he wanted each step to be irreversible, but we would take each step with a degree of caution. And until we can see really this rise in the infection uh, level off uh, and start to, to dip downwards, um, it would be premature to, to prevent and to, to depart from the approach that we've got. Where are we with vaccine passports? Well, we've made clear uh, this week that when it comes to the, uh, you know, younger people who want to uh, attend nightclubs, we're going to make it a requirement Absolutely. from the end of September that they would need a, effectively to be double jabbed in order to go into those venues. Those venues are much, uh, you know, higher risk, obviously, they're very crowded. We think actually there is a case... So uh, in football those terraces, instances. though? Yes, well, in, in and we some... And we saw what happened with the football with England-Scotland game, that, you know, there were super spreaders who, came, who were here and then caught it and, and went back up to Scotland. Well, look, we're, we're looking... There's a range of different approaches you can have. You can have uh, testing arrangements so that people have to test before they go to those uh, venues so that you don't have people with the infection and the virus going into those. Um, you know, that double jabbing is always obviously an option. We don't want to use it more than we need to. Um, the Prime Minister has been very clear, for instance, that we, we definitely want to avoid using it in pubs and so on. Uh, but as well, we about chart... The terraces? Well, look, as we chart our way out of this... You know, we can't rule anything out, but I know that uh, uh, the government set out earlier this week um, some of the uh, types of situations where it could be used. So yeah, big, but there's no big clarity conferences. on that. And, of course, we're around the corner from the football season. What's the thought? Well, then we're, we're talking about um, uh, major events, big conferences, those are the, uh, but mainly indoor ones. Those are the types so of situations. what about theatres? Uh, well, theatres, it is a possibility. And I know, you know, theatres themselves are actually uh, looking for an option that's going to enable them to start to open with a degree of confidence. So um, they want that ability to be able to open with confidence and it's something that we are considering. Okay. We're not exiting all restrictions. The government's going to be bringing in vaccine passports uh, at the end of September. We were told initially just for, well, we were told it wouldn't happen. Then we were told a few days later it would. It was for fee for nightclubs. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't go to nightclubs. It's fine. But now we're told it could be anywhere where there's a large group of people, concerts, cinema, theatre, uh, sports venues, even churches, synagogues, mosques and temples. Are you happy to be in a government which would require people to show their vaccine status at the door of a church? Well, look, we would obviously prefer not to. And the prime minister himself has said uh, that he, he doesn't want this to be used in pubs and uh, we want it to be used very, very sparingly. We think there is a case for it in the case of uh, nightclubs because they are uh, crowded venues where uh, the risk is higher. But we, we're not going to use this uh, unless it's necessary. I do understand uh, uh, you know, that argument. But equally, at this stage, we just need to make sure that we don't rule out some of these tools that might be needed to try to manage uh, you know, uh, an endemic presence of um, 
the coronavirus over over the medium term. We can't rule things out, but it is quite possible equally that when we get to the autumn, uh, we will have turned the corner on this and we won't need to do it at all. A bunch of young people, perfectly healthy, at very low risk from COVID. Um, uh, you know, 60% of that group of people already uh, have been had their first jab. Um, why on earth would it be needed? Well, we, in the case of young people, the numbers that have uh, had the uh, the jab, I think, is is um, is much lower at around thirty percent at the moment. We do want to uh, increase that. We're doing a lot of work to encourage more of those to uh, take uh, their vaccine. Um, and I think um, you know many of them may well think that um, it would be worthwhile getting it if if it's going to help them uh, access uh, the things that they love. Yeah, that Tory party conference. Well, uh, as, uh, as I say, it, it could be that business conferences, including possibly party conferences where you have large numbers of people uh, indoors, uh, there could be a case for it there. Um, you know, we haven't uh, ruled that out, uh, but we are, as I say, working through this. We haven't made final Some decisions. Some of your backbenchers said, don't you dare, if you do that, we are not coming to party conference. What would you say to them? Well, look, party conference is still some way uh, away. And uh, at the moment, we're very much focused on trying to get this current infection to, to level off, watching it very closely, making sure we keep hospitalizations down. Um, you know, we may be able to uh, refine the approach, have different decisions as we uh, go through later in the autumn. We'll be able to review things then in light of uh, how the situation's developing. But you'd rather go for the safety of the many than the um, uh, stubbornness of the few? Look, we, we want to have the option to be able to do the right thing uh, based on um, the evidence we have when we're there and what the prevalence of the virus is. It, it's very difficult to predict exactly where it'll be. Uh, we've got a high degree of confidence that we've severed the link between infection and, and hospitalisation, um, but it's been reduced by about 95%. Uh, there's still a residual risk there. That's why we still need to show a little bit of caution. But, um, you know, we are confident that we're going to be able to keep that hospitalisation down and return to life closer to normal. Turning to normal, of course, there is a party conference, hopefully, later in the year, although some of your colleagues are suggesting they won't attend the Conservative conference if the two jabs are made mandatory. What's your message to them, Secretary of State? Well, look, uh, the party conferences are still some way off, to be honest. Uh, the, the position that we've set out is uh, we think uh, this idea of showing that you've been double jabbed might well be important, particularly on things like large conferences that are indoors or uh, business events that are, that are indoors. Um, we, we need to keep these tools at our disposal at the moment. It may well be that as we get through um, uh, September, uh, that things will be looking much better and that we won't need to do that. But at the moment, uh, we think we need to keep these tools at our disposal and keep them on the table should they be needed. OK, can we go to France just briefly? I know I've only got you for another moment. You'll be aware that the rates of the so-called beta variant now have dropped quite dramatically. Why do we still have the extra sort of amber plus for people returning from France, Minister? Secretary of State, sorry. Well... And look, these are these are reviewed uh, regularly. Obviously, earlier this week we took quite a, a significant decision, which is to say that people that have been double jabbed can return from an amber list country without the need uh, to quarantine. Uh, there was a reason at the time that the advice was we should put uh, France on that amber list, as you say. It was concern about the the beta variant and the fact that the the vaccine might be um, slightly less effective uh, against that. But if, as those rates come down, obviously the evidence will change and it can be reviewed and we'll want to be putting countries like France uh, back onto the amber list in the normal way. Does that include wearing a mask? Because you told me you didn't want to. Well, I don't want to wear a mask, no, but I am still, uh, I can tell you, uh, wearing a mask on trains uh, and in crowded areas. Uh, and I think it's a courteous thing to do if you go to a shop and they are asking you to uh, wear a mask and have that on the door. You know, of course, you should do the right thing and continue to wear it. Uh, I'd love to get to the, the time when we uh, no longer have to wear masks. I find them very uncomfortable. Uh, but while they still perform a function in dampening the spread of the virus and while people are asking me to do it on trains and uh, in shops, I'll continue to. Uh, the Police Federation has no confidence in the Home Secretary. Do you? Uh, of course I do, yes. I work very closely with Pretty, and uh, uh, I've got great confidence. And if you look at what she's done on policing, we've uh, seen the recruitment of an extra uh, 8,000 police officers. We've seen an increase in mm, the We're playing with those figures. I'm not going to go into the figures today because, as you know, you cut 21,000, but yeah. Uh, but she's uh, under her watch. We've been increasing police numbers, and it's also um, the case that she's taken action to make sure the police have got uh, the powers that they need to do their job and to remove some of the frustration. So uh, I think she's doing... A fine job as, as Home Secretary. OK, but if the NFU, for example, said they want you to go, would you go? 
Um, well, I probably wouldn't if I thought I was doing the job right. My view on these things is... Um, so while let's, you're... let's ignore the unions. Well, look, you, uh, in this role in politics, um, whatever job you're in, you will get a degree of criticism. There will be things uh, that you have to do that may well be the right thing to do, but aren't always popular with everyone. Um, that's par for the course. It goes with the territory. You never thought for a second, though, when you agreed to go into politics to, to serve for the greater good, that you'd have to deal with what you've had to deal with over the last 18 months? Well, you? it's been an extraordinary 18 months, but for the whole country. So, yeah, yes, of course. Uh, huge uh, pressure on our political system and on uh, government. Um, a huge responsibility to try to get this right. Um, but also, um, let's bear in mind, it's been a much bigger trauma for the NHS who've had to cope with this. Uh, all those key workers, uh, all those businesses that have uh, struggled as well. Sure. Uh, that is where our main concern is because they've been the most affected. We're out of time. Just want to ask you about the Rugby World Cup. Australia and New Zealand have said they are not coming. They've been referred to as uh, cowards by uh, rugby league people here. I'm not sure if you're a rugby league fan. You're probably more a rugby union fan, I'm guessing. But what are your thoughts about them not coming? Well, you know, I think it is a choice for them. So I, I wouldn't use um, that type of language. But at the same time, you know, we do want to try to move back to um, life Should as normal. Should they reconsider? And well, um, I, you know, I hope that they might, but I, I'm not going to second-guess a decision that they make. You know, every country in the world is having to make difficult decisions based on their own circumstances. We've had to take decisions that uh, not every other country in the world would have liked, but we're all wrestling with this difficult situation. Yeah, it doesn't bode well for the cricket and, and uh, the, the test and thing. The, um, no, and obviously, ashes, you know, with the, the European Cup and everything, we've tried sure. to facilitate those sporting events to try and ensure that things can try to get back to normal. So, I, you know, I think it's disappointing, but it is ultimately a decision for them. Okay.